Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Quack, and welcome to my breakout session on using machine learning to meet general data protection regulations. So just a brief introduction of myself. I work, I work as the lead cloud architect in Avalon Solutions. We are a premier partner of Google globally, and our headquarters are, is in Sweden. Our specialties within GCP are in infrastructure lift and shift. We do machine learning projects as well. And we also help the customers get the best out of their Google Suite experience. Now, in the brief session, uh, we're going to cover a few topics. So what is GDPR, and who does this affect? And to understand GDPR, we have, uh, have to understand as well what is personal data. Then we're going to talk about the protections given by GDPR to EU citizens. And next, we're going to go through a few use cases and how to use machine learning to provide those protections. So what is GDPR? So GDPR is a regulation that protects personal data of EU citizens and the processing and movement of their data as well. So this regulation actually goes into force 25th May of this year. As you might have remembered, from the 23rd onwards of May, there was many companies sending you emails with enhanced terms and conditions, requesting your consent to use your data for their, for their processing needs. Now, that's the first step to GPR, is attaining consent. Now, who does this affect? This affects any organization that collects, stores, and processes personal data. And this is on, on European citizens. So it doesn't matter if you are from a US company or you are an Asian company, you will have to comply with these regulations as well. And any uh, non-compliance actually covers, comes with a very huge fine. The fine can come to almost to 4% of the annual re revenue. Now let's talk about personal data. So these are some examples of personal data, things like your name, your ID number, or in the US, your social security number, your credit card number, your email address, even your picture is data that belongs to you. Now, it can sit in many, in many forms. It can sit as structured data in the database, or it can sit as unstructured data in your Google Docs, your slides, or your spreadsheets, and even your emails. Now, think about it this way. Data, as we know it now, in GDPR, the company doesn't own your data anymore. What you're doing, you're actually loaning your data to the companies for them to use it, and you have the right to control the data which you give them. So this is what GDPR is about. So what are the main protections given by GDPR to EU citizens? I like to, I like to use a mnemonic here called the Big Red Rhino Protect Data. So when you think about GDPR, think about Big Red Rhino. The B stands for breach notification. R stands for right of access, the right to be forgotten, privacy by design, as well as data protection officers. Now let's break down the problem. As Avalon Solution, right, we have many managed services that we build for customers. And GDPR is approaching, right? We also we have systems in GCP with data in Drive. We have personal data in Drive. We have personal data in cloud storage buckets, in S3 buckets. Now, what we need to do next is to create functionality to allow a user to be forgotten completely from systems, to retrieve all related information about a user if the user requests for the information. We need to build breach notification capabilities. And we also need to rethink our systems with privacy in mind. Now, this is a lot of data we're going, we're going to handle. So we, we look at GCP, and we see, look at the kind of products they offer, things like PubSub, so we can handle large amounts of uh, data coming in. We, use, we leverage App Engine, which is uh, one of the, to me, I love App Engine, because you can fling up great web inter interfaces really quickly, which is a very great, great way to get input to train your machine learning models. We're going to leverage face recognition technology as well. And going to use some of these uh, open source uh, face recognition models where we can use to detect faces to fulfill the right. We're going to look at the data loss prevention API as well, Google Drive APIs. And we also use BigQuery and Stack Driver logging. So this was our strategy. We're going to use as much GCP products as we can to fulfill the rights of, uh, to build these protections of GDPR so that we can actually meet the deadline of 25th May. So let's jump into a breach notification. What is a breach? So when you build systems on GCP, right, you, have, you build your firewalls and you prevent 
uh, you, you kind of prevent as, you have a lowest right and lowest permission, so people cannot access the systems. But how do you actually detect a breach? How do you know your system has been breached? So one of the tactics as well is using uh, machine learning to detect logs, intrusions, different kind of patterns. So one of our use cases was actually using TCP dump as a very simple tool to log all DNS calls from uh, servers and as well as all uh, workstations. And, you, and we pipe all these DNS URL calls into Stackdriver. And what's great about that is that Stackdriver is serverless, so it can, it can handle as much load as you give it, basically. So it has also handle these millions of calls that can occur on the server on our workstation. Now, using a re uh, recurrent neural network with uh, long short term memory, we can detect. So, OK, a little bit of background on malware. So, when malware attacks your, one of your VMs, right, what it does is it uses a domain generation algorithm to try to connect to a, a command control server to get further instructions to take the next step, either to destroy your information or to hold it ransom. So, this was one of the tactics that's used by the CryptoLocker ransomware in order to um, get further instructions. So, uh, for example, in, in your stack driver logs, if you see a domain name uh, in the bottom left corner there, it, it means that your system has been attacked by the CryptoLocker crypto ransomware and is infected. Um, the source paper is over here. So what we did was that we had trained this model uh, using uh, ML Engine, and we provided the two sources of informa information. So the first source was using the top one million websites that were real from Alexa and as well as using the domain generation algorithms that were cracked already to generate large amounts of training data of malicious DNS URLs. And what we do is that we train it on ML Engine, and we also put it on, uh, in the cloud data store where we detect there is possible breaches. And one thing about ML models as well is that you, you need constant feedback in order to continuously improve, continuously improve your model. So we also create a web interface on for DevOps guys to actually go in and classify any suspicious errors as benign or malicious. This is for probabilities that are lower than, say, 60%, so that we can actually continuously update the model and improve it. We also make use of Cloud Composer, which is basically Apache Airflow, to continuously train it once a week so that it's updated on the, uh, on the fly as we go along. So I'm going to jump to a quick demo over here on my screen. So for this case, we have the malware DNS monitoring. Let's click on it. Pardon the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Check on Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's taking a while. All right, great. Sorry for that. So all these logs are actually going into Stack Driver right now, and we have also had logged the resource names as well as the probability of it being a malicious uh, DNS, call, DNS call. And what the DevOps guy can go in to do, actually, is just tag it as being a malicious. It's a very simple, continuously improving process. So if, for example, let's just type in some uh, addresses here to classify. So you look at google.com, for example. So it has a very low chance of being malicious. Uh, let's, let's take a long address uh, domain name, just to check whether it's it length that we're talking about. That's also a very low chance of it occurring. So we take something that I generated off a domain generation algorithm over here for CryptoLocker. You can see there's a higher probability of being malicious. So it's not just the length. It's also the placement of the consonants uh, within vowels. And how we detect that is by using the neural network to, to train it and get the right detections. So this is one way you can actually use machine learning to detect these malicious DNS URLs. Can I go back to the slides? Can we go back to the slides? Thanks. So next, the right of access. So 
what if the, what is the right of access? So when a person goes to your company and say, give me all the personal information you have with your, in, within your systems to me. The, with GDPR, you have to comply. Within, uh, and then to we talk about how do you do it? Uh, how do you, what do you use the, what do you use the data for? And, yeah. and you actually have to give all this data back in a readable form. Now, how do you do that when all your information is stored in G Suite and in, in buck, storage buckets and you have not enough metadata to understand? How do you do it for pictures, for maybe your company photos uh, when you go for outings? Now, what we, what we built actually, we use um, Google Drive and we actually scan through all the files and Google Docs, Google Sheets, spreadsheets every time it has been changed, as well as PDFs and image files. First, using Google Vision APR, that has also has OCR capabilities as well. So like even your credit card number on a picture is considered personal data as well. This is triggered using Google Drive and Google Cloud Storage push notifications. They push the pops up, and then what we do is that we push it to App Engine as a call, which will call the APIs and try to figure out is this personal data or not. To access this right, users have to go and supply, the actually, supply their personal data to search within the system. So, for example, for me, I submit a photo of myself going from left to right, top to bottom. And then this is used as a picture to scan for all the, all the image files within cloud storage as well as Google Drive for, the, for me in it. So when new images are saved in the Google Drive and cloud storage, they're actually first scanned by Google Vision API. So they can annotate on the faces. So we find the coordinates, whether this photo has a face in it or not. The reason, the reason is that we use Google Vision API because it's serverless and can handle massive scale compared to using our open face models directly. The reason for that is, yeah, is like I mentioned, it's serverless as well as much cheaper. So when we detect there is a face within an image, and this is images not only stored as JPEG, but images that are stored within a Google Doc or within a Google Slide. So there are embedded images as well we are talking about. When we detect there is a face, we will extract the face, find the coordinates, crop it out, and use open face to get the vector vectors of the face. So your face becomes basically a floating point number vector, and we store it into BigQuery. The reason we use BigQuery is because it allows us to search for these images in a very good manner and a very fast manner as well. So we search for the lowest Euclidean distance between, say, my face and other, other faces stored within systems. So any matches above a certain threshold are then stored into Cloud Data Store. And you can actually look at it from the App, en uh, App Engine website as well. So I'm going to jump into the demo here. So you look at the personal data search. What I'm going to do is just submit my face over here, just something I just took earlier on. Yeah, so I get a search ID back. So what it's doing now is vectorizing my face. Give it a few seconds. Yeah, so what it's doing now in the background is actually running, uh, getting my, my face data, and then using the, we actually run open face as a container on GKE, and then getting the vectors out, and then doing a query on BigQuery. Let's refresh it. Search completed. So what now you, you can see is that I have some images on me that I actually put out on the G Suite system. Uh, and then you can actually have the link, the owner of the images of the document as well. And of course, um, there is a few other, that is my son. <laughs> so it's quite close, but not close enough. Then some of my colleagues over here in the, bot the bottom. So what you do normally, you do a threshold. So you can find the closest matches to your faces, and then you can deliver it as a, in a document. So we can open a document here as well, which is in slides. You see some tests here. And this is how you look like in uh, BigQuery. Let's run a query. Over here, you can see that there's, this, are the, how, this is how basically your face looks like as a vector. Can you change back to the slides? Thanks. 
Thanks. So now, the right to be forgotten. So that we're going to build the next step, which is the right to be forgotten by a user. So for example, if a person answers a question to a quiz, and you store it in a, using Google, Google Forms, you store it to a spreadsheet. Now, after, after you have um, entered a quiz and you got a prize, you actually can request to get your data removed from the system so that you can prevent direct marketing. Um, and, this, and the user organization actually have to comply because it is, it's within your rights to remove that information. But however, the, the, the company may, not, may have use for that information as well. You want to keep track of maybe the answer that you give. So even though your name identifies you, maybe the, the, the answer that you give to the question does not identify you. So that doesn't fall within the scope of personal data. So when the person submits a request to be forgotten, the DPO will actually go using the App Engine uh, web interface to look on, to do a request for access, to invoke the right access to get all the hits you get back on your G Suite and your, on your buckets. And what the DPO does is that it will then make the few, next few steps. Do I remove the whole document? Because uh, I don't even know, but in G Suite as well, there's version, there's version handling as well. For every single document you have, every single spreadsheet, every single slide, there is versioning, which means that if you just remove the picture on the latest version and you save it, what you do can you actually go back to the previous version very easily and get back the pictures again, which means that actually you have not really removed all the personal data from the system. And that's actually something that is a kind of a catch. So once the, one, one possible way is to actually remove the whole document if you don't need the information. Next step is to remove the relevant information. Now, this is a quite a troublesome procedure because what you need to do is recreate the entire document removing the personal data. So we now we have automated that. So it actually recreates the entire document, but without the personal information that the user has requested for to be, remo to be removed. Or can replace the information with dummy data. Or do you maybe re remove the sentence of the row? So there's a few kind of uh, decision-making process here that the DPO, the DPO has to do to uh, actually take. Now, what we use for training the model actually is we want to actually Im imitate the DPO and try to see what, what kind of factors does he take in consideration to execute the next steps. So we look at features such as number of words in a file. If it's a large file, you cannot remove the whole entire file because you may need certain information from the file as well. Maybe a, so that is a consideration. When it was last modified, if it's a very old file, maybe you don't need it anymore. The type of personal information is it a picture? Is it a face in a picture? Then maybe it doesn't make sense to put a red triangle on the picture and re-upload it again, covering one person's face. Maybe just remove the entire picture directly. The access rights of the file. Who has access to these files? So if it's only one person that has already left the company, then you know it's not really. You can just remove the document. The location of the file. So what we did is restructure the entire um, G Suite uh, layout as well, so that the location of the file actually. Uh, de determines and dictates what kind of where should you keep different kinds of personal information. So the DPO actually will make a decision, and then that is trained to this NL model. And this ML model is actually very, a very simple model. It's just a linear classifier to to, to give you like a, whether it should be removed or whether it should be redacted or replaced with dummy data. So what happens is that the model will make the suggestions through the web interface, and the DPO, and then it becomes life becomes easier for DPO. And right now, we don't have enough data to actually make this decision automatically. So what we're doing now is actually just running a few scenarios to generate training data so that we can eventually automate the system. So when it comes to invoking the right to be forgotten, you can just invoke it, and we can make a decision. Someone has just confirmed it, and you can remove all these documents away. OK, so I'm now going to jump into privacy by design. So with Google Suite and Google Cloud Storage, one of the awesome things you can do is share files, right? You can share files, and you can, you can give uh, share by links. You can sh add people in the groups. But with privacy by design, what that kind of means to us is that you have to kind of think of privacy at the highest level. Because when you think about someone loaning you the data, that means that you're responsible for it. You have, to, you have to make sure that you don't share data irresponsibly and cause a problem to your company. So any changes in the access rights of file with personal data should be investigated. So like you mentioned, uh, one of the previous tasks was actually identifying any documents with personal data, right? So that is done. Now, how do you understand which is a dangerous access right change? How do you do that? 
So to get any change in terms of um, access changes, you, we actually use um, Stackdriver again. They actually have inbuilt logging of any uh, changes to cloud storage objects, which is great. And then this published directly in the pops up. You know, so, uh, and it flows so well together that it just took us like one day to just implement this. It's, really, it's so fast. And using uh, Google Drive, you can actually subscribe to push notifications as well. So when, every time there is a permission change, it will also update you and tell you, OK, there is this, um, yeah, so someone has, this document has been shared to somebody. So again, we pipe it through, through to PubSub into App Engine, and we also train a model. And the model detects whether the access right change is correct or not. In this case, it's, only, it's binary only. So some of the features that we use, we use who do you share the files to? For example, in GCS, you can share, you can share objects into a, to a service account. Or do, you share, or do you share to a group of users? So this, obviously, sharing to a group of users, just mean, it means that you can do that. But is that, is that an access right violation? So if you share personal data to a group, you, know, you better do it, do it carefully. The location of a file, like I mentioned, we restructured our, our, file, our file storage so that we can put personal data in the correct places. The job title and department of the user, we found that actually quite, um, quite useful as well. For example, the marketing department doesn't have to have access to the CVs that the HR have, right? But the manager of marketing department may need access to the CVs. So we found that that's quite an interesting um, feature that we use as well, as well as your, the current permissions the user has. So with that, we just, train, we just train a linear regression model. And it actually comes back and tags any changes in the access rights as, polish, as possibly correct or incorrect. And DevOps actually can go in and monitor these access right changes as well. And, you see, and if, if you see like a large amount of access right changes being made, they can also detect that and flag that as a possible violation. So the last thing I want to talk about is uh, as the data protection officer. So GCP is a data processor, right? So the, the company using the GCP is the data controller, which in this case is us, Avalon Solutions. So what in every single company you need to do, you need to designate a data protection officer uh, that, man, that basically handles all issues with, with personal data and the protection of personal data. So this means that the DPO can be very, very busy. Okay? They have to train their users as well how to, where to store the personal data. Like I mentioned, there is locations of where you should store your uh, personal data, in which, in which file, in which directory. And also to answer some questions on GDPR and some company-specific questions. So for this, we use Dialogflow to build a chatbot so that our employees can actually go in and ask questions about GDPR and whether is this personal data or not. So a few examples we, we got is like, for example, we, have, we run workshops on Kubernetes workshops. So you, are, so you can actually go into our DPO uh, chatbot and ask, where should I save the sign-up list, the spreadsheet? So even though you train your you train your people about how to use, where to, save, where to save personal data. You can also, on the fly, ask the DPO chatbot, say, you should save it into this directory. You should only share, share it to this, uh, this person and this group so that you don't, share, you don't accidentally leak out your, your usernames or your email addresses. Another question we often, often get from our employees is, is the username considered personal data? And then we often have many discussions about that. But the, 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 so we can answer to you as well that pseudo-anonymous data is actually considered personal data as well. Because that can be linked back from a Google search, because maybe of many, a lot of people use actually their usernames in many of different platforms. So you can trace back to, say, Facebook or any social media profiles and leaking the true identity. So this is kind of considered personal data as well. So, in, 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 con in conclusion, what I'm trying to show is that the GDPR work, uh, kind of things that we did, when we use AI to kind of solve it, it was kind of like, you think about it, who wants to work on compliance, right? It's kind of a, in, kind of a dry topic. But we found a way to use some of the latest technologies in the, out there in, in Google Cloud and in the world to kind of spice things up so we can learn, learn things on the fly as well, to learn machine learning as well as we go along and to try to test uh, whether it does it actually work. And the best way to understand whether it works is by using it. 
So we see that it does benefit. We do save a lot of time classifying this information and tracking this potentially harmful violations. And so that we can actually go out and build other cool stuff. So yeah, that's all I have. Uh, my, my email address is here, jasonquack at avalanchesolutions.com. So if any questions, you know, feel free to drop me a mail, and we can discuss a little bit more about how we build some of these solutions and other things you have to think about to, to make sure that your organization is protected in GDPR. Thanks. <laughs>